Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Is the Democratic Party nominee Hillary Clinton physically fit to be president of the United States? Rumors and the suggestion she is in poor health have been dismissed as conspiracy theories. That has changed. Shouldn't Hillary Clinton level with the voters? To Crosstalk Campaign Clinton, I'm joined by my guest, Philip Giraldi in Washington. He is a former CIA counterterrorism specialist who is now executive director of the Council for the National Interest and writes for the American Conservative. Also in Washington, we have Doug Weed. He is a presidential historian and a former White House advisor to two American presidents. And in New York, we cross to Rob Taub. He is a political pundit and journalist contributing to the Huffington Post. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, first of all, gentlemen, before we start the program, here. I am not a medical doctor, and I want to stay away from that area because I find it very disingenuous that so many journalists covering the Hillary Clinton story, particularly in the last few news cycles, speak like doctors or like they have some kind of a medical knowledge, okay? I am not going to do that. So having said that, Philip, I'd like to go to you first here. Uh, how do you react to everything that has happened in the last few news cycles? Um, I, like I said, I want to stay away from specific health issues because I don't want to go there. But, you know, Hillary Clinton did say to... Uh, Anderson Cooper on CNN. I didn't think pneumonia was a big deal, but it's not the pneumonia that's the big deal, is it? Go ahead. Well, clearly there are two issues here. I mean, the one issue is indeed the health issue because obviously if you're running for president of the United States and you're seen on video uh, behaving in, in such a fashion as to question what your health might be like, you have to address the issue. And, and if, but I think the bigger issue is the, uh, what some might call a cover-up about you know, what exactly happened to her and uh, what, uh, what basically was going through their minds when they discovered she had pneumonia, but uh, we're in no way public about this. This uh, raises issues about the, uh, uh, the honesty of the Clintons, which of course have been raised for years and years and years, and I, I think that's going to be the more lasting damage. Okay, let me go to Doug, also in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's pick up on what uh, Philip had to say. It's all about credibility and transparency. Go ahead. Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the Clinton campaign is bungling this whole story. They, they say, no, it's, there's no blood clot on the brain or the concussion. This is all about highly contagious pneumonia. And then they show her uh, <laughs> embracing this uh, young lady for a photo op while the, the media stands way back so she can't cough on him. And just a few days before, she had uh, appeared at a $34,000 a plate dinner. You had to pay $34,000 to get pneumonia, this girl could get it free. And of all things, they, they declare, well, she's got contagious pneumonia, but she's gone over to Chelsea's house to play with her granddaughter. <laughs> so they're not handling this very well. The credibility issue uh, is showing. Okay, Rob, weigh in on that, there, because those are some of the same questions I had as well. I mean, and looking at that video, again, not to, to give any kind of forensic analysis of her health, but, I mean, the optics of it looked very severe, and then 90 minutes later, out in the springy air of New York City, and it's really what the Clinton campaign said. That's what's interesting to me, and I think it is troublesome. Go ahead. The optics looked fine to me, first of all, and I don't see what's so terrible about what the Clinton campaign said. I'm going to defend Hil Hillary okay. here very strongly. She, she, ha she had what seemed to be a small fainting episode, which any of us can have. I'm a type 2 diabetic. I've had low blood sugar. I can get woozy. I was in the park at that same time, in fact, and it was rather warm out, and I was out for a jog, and I sat down on the park bench a couple of times. But she went from from there to Chelsea's apartment, and she came out and had I not known anything had happened to her, and I think everybody else can agree. She looked fine, happy, robust, and she greeted this young girl. They said that she had walking pneumonia. I heard nothing about any level of contagion okay, or okay. contagiousness. Okay, well, Philip, well, well, let's stay with that. Well, actually, but... some okay, of her ahead. own staff have caught pneumonia, so... <laughs> Some of her own staff now, we learn, have caught pneumonia. So either it's a grand coincidence or it is contagious. Richard Nixon had pneumonia in 1973 when he was president, and it was walking pneumonia, and he was hospitalized for a week. So pneumonia can be serious. 
Okay, Philip, one of the things that I've taken away from this campaign is that um, uh, the scrutiny that the, the Clinton gets from the mainstream media, particularly corporate media, they give her very often a pass. And I watched the coverage, particularly on CNN, and I thought it was just a lot of softballs there. Again, I'm not going to address the, the health issue here, but how the campaign is dealing with it. She, Hillary Clinton can't remember when she was getting some kind of security interview. She can't remember what happened to emails. She, I mean, it just seems to be a very soft ball, soft, soft, a soft touch when it comes to uh, answering questions uh, concerning public affairs. Go ahead, Philip. Well, I think it's, it's clear to anyone watching the process that the mainstream media, uh, both print media and the more active media, want Hillary to win. So obviously they're, they're shading the way they approach issues that relate to her. Uh, but I think the, the thing that her campaign has to understand is that essentially if she loses this election, she's going to lose it on the issue of her honesty and credibility. So uh, I think this was something that they should have seen coming. Um, as, as Doug mentioned, uh, you know, uh, pneumonia is no joke. My doctor uh, advises me to get, uh, I'm about the same age as Hillary, and my doctor advises me every year to get the pneumonia uh, prevention injection because he says at your age, my age, her age, uh, pneumonia can kill you. Uh, many people at our age level die of pneumonia. So it's a serious issue. And I think that her campaign was certainly remiss in not realizing that this thing would come out sooner or later and that they would look foolish or worse uh, as a result of their actions. Okay, Doug, I mean, if, if we could re rewind this entire episode, wouldn't it have been better for the campaign, the Clinton, uh, Clinton campaign, to say, hey, our candidate has pneumonia, walking pneumonia, a virus, whatever their story is, and she's going to take a couple days off because she's had this very grueling process. And you know what? When you look at Trump and you look at uh, Hillary Clinton, that is a grueling thing. I don't, I don't think I could uh, keep up with that kind of pace. That's a, a lot of hard work here. But again, the issue of transparency, to say, hey, we need two days off to recover from some kind of ailment. Do you think that she would have been attacked for that? Because the, the sense of that there is a lack of transparency is what's causing this reaction against her campaign right now. <laughs> totally. I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, she is the 2016 Democrat nominee for president, and she hasn't given a press conference in the year 2016. So <laughs> transparency is way overdue, and it's more than what you said. It's not just that she isn't open. When a, when a journalist dares to ask her a question like Matt Lauer did uh, in the, the NBC forum, they're vilified by the New York Times. It's uh, extraordinary. And the Clinton Foundation, which now we see has clear quid pro quo, isn't even mentioned. USA Today does a whole story on the Clinton scandals, doesn't even mention the foundation. So yes, it's a problem of transparency. Both candidates have problems. But this is pretty scary. As a historian, uh, we've never had a president with this kind of corruption charges, a candidate who was elected president. We had Warren G. Harding as last year in office when some of these uh, issues erupted and especially after he left office. But we've never had anything quite like this. Maybe Charles Blaine, that's as close as we come. You know, Rob, Rob address the, the credibility issues that, that Hillary Clinton faces, because you know what? There's one thing is for sure. We all know her very well. We've been around. She's been around for a very long time, and she has been repeatedly investigated. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I think honesty is the best policy, but I think had she not shown up to the 9-11 ceremony that, that morning, she would have been vilified. It wouldn't have mattered if she'd been run over by a truck. People would have gone ballistic over that. So I understand why she made the choice not to say anything. And th that's, that's a huge problem for her, there's no doubt. But I think it's also the Clintons are both notorious uh, for for overworking themselves, and I don't think that's a good thing to do either. Bill Clinton had done it a lot in the past. I remember seeing him at a speech once, and he looked pale and wan, and I thought, why is he even out here? Why does this guy never take a break? And uh, pacing oneself is an important thing to do over this campaign and over the presidency. So. That's, uh, you know, th that's something they should consider. You know, Philip, you know, the, the entire uh, Clinton clan are notorious for their protection of privacy or lack of transparency here. 
I still would like a better understanding why someone that was not in good health, visibly and not in good health, uh, goes to her daughter's apartment instead of to a hospital or a clinic or, do, or tell us some kind of medical professional. Uh, you know, they, they, she's running for the highest office in the United States. She has to be more open about these things. We should know these things. Go ahead, Philip. Well, uh, clearly what she was doing was trying to minimize what everybody had just seen on television. She was uh, trying to, to uh, uh, either pretend or in reality uh, uh, project the image that this was, uh, was not as big a problem as others will see in it. Uh, today, uh, uh, on, the, on the media, in the media, it's been reported that she said she considered this no big deal. Yeah. Now, if she considered pneumonia no big deal, then there's certainly a problem with her thinking in terms of how she has to present herself to the public. This is a this is an image problem. And if you're and if you're you're claiming that you want to be president of the United States, you've you've had a concussion which led to a blood clot in your brain that took five months to resolve and, and now you're seen collapsing and and you admit that you have pneumonia, it is a big deal. I okay. think this, these are issues that have to be discussed. Okay, Philip, I have to jump in here. Gentlemen, we're gonna to go to a short break and after that short break we'll continue our discussion on Hillary Clinton. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing who is fit to be president. You know, Doug, one of the interesting things uh, I, I thought about uh, as this whole discussion about Hillary's health re, uh, was inflamed, because it's been around for the last few weeks here, but um, I have to give it to the Clintons. They are uh, amazing political operators. They make mistakes, but they certainly know how to come back. The reason why I'm mentioning this is that v shortly before that, uh, Hillary Clinton had her basket of deplorables, which really went down badly. I mean, even members of the Democratic establishment uh, thought that that was a, a, a blunder and maybe even more. And then within the course of a few hours, the entire news cycle is turned upside down and inside out. And we're talking about something very different, like on this program. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, uh, I think the deplorable issue was bad. You don't, you, you can attack your opponent and you attack the leaders. There's a rule of thumb about that, but you don't attack the people. Our own president uh, got in his own issues when he attacked the Russian people. He said Russia is a regional power. And then the next day, the American astronaut had to be ferried back to Earth <laughs> on a, a Russian space vehicle because the United States didn't have one. You don't attack the people, even if you, that, that's your enemy. You attack the leaders and make friends with the people. So if Hillary Clinton's going to be president of all the people, it's a mistake. It's okay to attack Donald Trump. It's a mistake to attack the people who support Donald Trump. And, and Romney learned that in the last cycle. Okay. And, you know, Rob, one of the things that it, it recently we've come out uh, from the Clinton administration, I'm sorry, the, the Clinton campaign, um, is the criticism of the media saying that uh, there's this alt, um, uh, alternative media, this vast uh, uh, media conspiracy uh, against her. I mean, we've, we heard that from Bill Clinton during his administration, but Hillary Clinton actually said the, that herself when she was first lady. Is this a trope that she likes to recycle here? Because yeah, I get the impression she thinks everyone's conspiring against her, including Va Vladimir Putin, first and foremost, because some people don't like her. Well, that's called politics. Oh, I think the, one of the big mistakes she's making, and I'm a Hillary supporter, is she's an attorney. If I, I'm not an attorney, but I watch a lot of the law and order marathons on Me television. Too. Me too. So I, I learned some of the legal <laughs> lingo. And one of them is asked and answered. And that's what she should say in regard to the, on, if she's battered by the press about the email scandal, then she just, she should say, look, I've been, a decision has been made. The FBI exonerated me, asked and answered. Let's talk about policy. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about what's going on in Syria. These are the pressing important issues that should be discussed because Trump certainly doesn't talk about policy. So I think she's making a political error well, there 
not to focus on those things. Well, I have, uh, Rob, I have to disagree with you. It seems to me that she doesn't really talk about the issues all that much. She spends most of her time uh, destroying the characters of others. That seems to be her strong card. And it keeps. I'm, it, I'm it, agreeing it, with you. I'm oh, okay, saying I okay. think she should be spending more time doing that. Okay, Philip. I let, think that's her big mistake. She should be focusing on policy. You know, Philip, that's the kind of entitlement that I, a lot. Of, I don't like Hillary Clinton. It's obvious on this program, and other, other people who have watched Crosstalk know, know that, okay? What I'm more interested in is politics and policy. And I, and I'm, I mean, and I'm, I'm pointing a finger at Mr. Trump as well, okay? I want to see much more of a policy driven campaign instead of this mudslinging, because it, this is the worst I have ever seen. I think it's a disgrace for the entire system. And, you know, if you're choosing between the worst of two evils, then the system itself is evil. Go ahead, Philip. Well, first of all, I'd like to correct something that Rob said. Uh, the FBI did not exonerate Hillary Clinton. It merely said that it did not have enough evidence to take her to trial and to try to convict her. That's quite a different thing. They were actually very, very critical of, of what she did and how she did it. So in, in terms of the other thing, yeah, I agree with you absolutely. I would like to see uh, both candidates talking more about issues in real terms. Like we hear a lot of, uh, from Donald Trump about immigration, but we don't hear very much in terms of what exactly he would do. Uh, Hillary uh, speaks to uh, her constituencies in the Democratic Party and in the general population. Trump tends to do the same thing. Uh, I guess this is a, a, a problem that comes from the 24-hour news cycle. Yeah. Everything has to be short, everything has to be to the point, and then you kind of drop it to go on to something else. You know, Doug, you, you, you know a lot about the, the, the presidency. You worked for two of them. How would you characterize this campaign compared to other ones that you've seen in your life and, and, and uh, have knowledge of? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it reminds me of 1880. <laughs> in, in 1880, it was a contest between a corrupt politician who took money in return for favors against a New York misogynist. The misogynist was a law partner, and he and his partners funded a young lady and in return for sexual favors. When she became pregnant, he stepped forward to assume paternity because his partners were all married. When one of his partners died, he raised his daughter. When the daughter became a teenager, she fell in love with him. When she turned 21, they were married, the only president to be married in the White House. That's Grover Cleveland. That was 1880, Charles Blaine against Grover Cleveland. And uh, the American people said, how did we get here? <laughs> and that's kind of what I'm hearing uh, this election cycle. Well, Doug, I want you to come back more often because I think a lot of people just learned something. I, I'm a pretty good uh, student of the, of the presidency, and I missed that one, okay? Okay, Rob, uh, let's talk about Hillary again, because, uh, again, I started out the program, uh, it's about credibility. One of the things, and I think it's a sad comment, is that people are used, used to uh, her being called dishonest, uh, corrupt, um, uh, not transparent. I mean, this is something that she's had to deal with for 20 years of public life. I mean, that's a pretty sad comment for a, for a candidate because her, you know, her negatives in some of those categories are really, really uh, low or high in that case, okay? I mean, what kind of candidate, do you, why do you support her? What kind of candidate is she in your mind? I think that I try to put aside the personal, personal aspects of it and look at her experience in government, what kind of president her husband was, and that she understands bipartisanship, which I don't think our existing president does at all. And I think that's what we need. And I don't, I think Trump would be nothing but partisan. And I think Hillary Clinton would work also in conjunction with her husband, who happens to be a, a great politician and, and un understands how our government works. And I think that she would bring us to center and I make think things it's just happen the opposite. and make deals, which is what the job of the president is. It's, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's her experience that disqualifies her and that it's not about partisanship, it's about money. I mean, Gilbert Chogary, the Lebanese Nigerian businessman, gave a million and a half dollars to the Clinton Foundation. Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. She wouldn't declare the Boko Haram as terrorists. The Al Qaeda condemned the Boko Haram. President Obama asked her to declare them as terrorists. She wouldn't do it. They threatened to kill our ambassador, but Gilbert 
Choguri owned the biggest hotels in Nigeria. It was bad for tourism. Only when she left office did John Kerry and Barack Obama declare the Boko Haram as terrorists. That's not experience. That's uh, the Lannisters always pay their debts. That's <laughs> telegraphing to people. If you get us money, you figure out how to get it to us Game legally and safely, we'll take care of you. Okay. I, I don't want someone with that kind okay. of experience the, 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 Philip, to you've be written, president. You've written some pretty um, stinging comments about Hillary Clinton uh, in the last few months. Uh, and you talk about policy. So let's talk about Hillary Clinton as a policy president. Go ahead. What would you see happening? Well, I, I see I, I see two very poor candidates out there, and the, the the critical difference that I note is that Hillary Clinton is the war candidate. Yep. Hillary Clinton, in in all of her speeches, basically uh, is 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 ready to con confront Russia, is ready to confront Iran, is ready to put uh, a pressure on getting rid of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, she's a war candidate. She wants to arm Ukraine. She wants to provoke Russia. She wants to provoke China. Uh, to me, that is the fundamental difference. Uh, I, as I say, I see two poor candidates, but I will vote against Hillary Clinton because I am against uh, nuclear war. Is that one way to put it? I'm against a candidate that basically is going around the world, as John Adams put it, looking for dragons to slay. We don't need that in the United States. Doug, weigh in. What kind of candidate do you see in Hillary Clinton? Go ahead. Well, I'm a historian, so I'm objective, but I have to say I'm leaning to Trump because I see him as the class clown. I don't like what he's saying about the fat girl across the room, but I love the fact that he's disrupting the class. He talks about going to the lowest bidder, which would take it away from the oligarchy in the United States, which is destroying our country. The last two presidents, we've seen this huge transfer of wealth to a tiny percentage of people. And I see even the Bernie phenomena as uh, uh, even the idea of socialism is kind of the poor man's way to game the system. They, they can't get money from the Federal Reserve like the big shots, but they'll get you to pay for their rent and their education. And so I like Trump because I think he's disruptive and he's unpredictable. And that's what we may need right now to break out of this terrible corruption that we're in as a country and a society. Okay, Rob, I'll give you the last, uh, last word there. Do you want to react to any of that? We're almost out of time. Well, I'm going to agree with a lot of that. I, I do think Trump is the class clown. He says things that are often true. The problem is he has no idea or solution about how to address them. But I do, I am against big government. Peter Thiel wrote a really wonderful op-ed piece on the Washington Post uh, recently and talked about the Manhattan Project and how the government was able to do that, how much it cost, how many workers we had, and compared it to today's healthcare system, which when launched, we couldn't even build a website, <laughs> <That's> despite right. <laughs> spending half a billion dollars on that. Rob, I'm sorry, I have so, to jump in here. Gentlemen, uh, we've run out of Trump time. stirring up in people. I'm really, we've run out of time, I'm really sorry. Many thanks to my guests in Washington and in New York, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.